This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. My great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Satterfield, who's, we've worked together now for at least 10 years, probably? 15. 15, oh, thank you for my mental status alertness. Um, Dr. Satterfield is an associate professor in, of medicine and director of the behavioral medicine program in my division of general internal medicine. And I just found out from the bibliography that he's also an author of a book that's about to be published next February, so I've already gotten a commitment to get a signed copy. Um, he's really, really, really a gifted teacher and more importantly an expert in the area that he's going to be discussing tonight. And I already shared with him that after all of your questions two weeks ago after Dr. Kemeny's uh, presentation on the effect of stress on the immune system that you were all very anxious to hear about concrete tools and how that manifests itself in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Satterfield. Well, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. And I, I think you might see that uh, the talk tonight is a slight change of pace. Uh, I believe you guys have learned a lot about the basic science, the basic research behind stress and behind coping. You've also learned from Dr. Kimeny two weeks ago about the physiology of stress, of course, important for disease. And it's one of the reasons, probably the main reason, we want to learn about stress management. Uh, tonight, I decided that I would take a very practical and very clinical approach. So we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, very practical, hands-on, on, uh, hopefully useful interventions that you can try for yourself or for your loved ones in order, order in terms of reducing the uh, magnitude of your stress response. Where we're going to focus, there, there's uh, really a long, long menu uh, of different types of stress management ideas that we could talk about, but we're going to focus really on how to use our minds to change the way our bodies feel, uh, the broad category of mind-body medicine, but more specifically, we're gonna look at cognitive behavioral interventions and how they influence our experience of stress, sometimes in negative ways, but hopefully we'll learn uh, to use them in positive ways. In order to do that, there are sort of several uh, uh, roadmarks we need to uh, uh, pass through uh, uh, along the way today. We want to talk first about some of the stress basics, and I want to calibrate our language to make sure that the words and terms I'm using are sort of matching what you guys have learned already. I want to share some basic cognitive behavioral foundations, so really give you a little bit of the history and sort of the theoretical underpinnings of why we think changing the way you think might change the way your body feels. Um, let me say from the outset that this is not the don't worry, be happy seminar. Uh, this is is not uh, about wordplay, it's not about mind games or sophistry, it's about understanding the interconnectedness between how we think uh, and how we feel and the, the behavioral choices that we make. We're going to go through some specific examples of how to work with appraisals, the way we think about stressors and the way we think about coping. We'll talk about a specific example of explanatory style. We'll then move to some present moment coping strategies to change the way that we feel both emotionally and also physically. But from there, we'll go to much uh, uh, deeper ways of coping, something I've called depth coping. It's not necessarily about the present moment, but it helps us to lay a more solid foundation in facing the stressors that might be ahead of us in the future. And there, we'll talk about connections, we'll talk about social support, and we'll end by talking about meaning. 
So this is just a quick review from you guys. Uh, Susan Folkman, the very first lecture of this series, talked about some of her research uh, uh, with uh, uh, Dick Lazarus. She talked about the stress process, and these are some of the major players or, or uh, stages in this process. First on the left, we have the occurrence of a potential stressor. This could be real or it could be imagined. This could be an exam you have to take. This could be a deadline at work. This could be a uh, conflict, a recurrent conflict that you have with a spouse. We think about that stressor in a couple of different ways. We have our primary appraisals, thoughts that you have about the stressor. Does it matter? Is it a big deal? What are the implications? Should I really be worried about this or not? Secondary appraisals, this is how think about your coping uh, resources. Am I able to face this? Do I know what to do? Do I have social supports? Do I have money, time, energy to do whatever needs to be done to face this potential stressor? So potential stressor happens. You think about the stressor. You do an appraisal of the stressor. You do an appraisal of your coping resources. And depending on your type of appraisal, it helps us to understand the type and the magnitude of your stress response. The appraisals help us to understand why two people can experience the exact same event. One will feel incredibly stressed. The other might not feel that stressed at all. It's because they probably thought differently about the importance of the stressor, the primary appraisal, or maybe they thought differently about their capacity to cope with that stressor. If we're looking at opportunities for stress management, you should already see that there's a couple of different places we could target those interventions. We could uh, change the likelihood you'll be exposed to a stressor, or we could change the way you think about the stressor, or change the way you think about your coping resources. That's not all. We also want to think about the nature of the stressor itself or really the frame that we put on the stressor. And in general, we divide stressors into two categories. Stress isn't bad. Stress is important. We need stress. It helps to activate us. It gives us energy. It sometimes gives us a focus uh, that we need in order to fix or to change a particular problem. But there's this split that occurs fairly early on and whether or not we see a stressor as something that's a challenge or something that's a threat. If we see something that's a challenge, yes, it may be difficult. It may require a lot of time and energy. But I feel a little jazzed up about it. It's a project at work that I really like, and it's going to take a lot of time. But I believe I'm up to it. I believe I'm going to learn some, something from it. I believe I can get help. It's a challenge, but I don't see it as a threat. For a threat in general, people see uh, it as something that uh, the outcome is somewhat unknown. A uh, positive outcome might be unlikely. Your capacity to cope with it, or even if you know what it will take to cope, uh, is much lower. You see it as a threat. You have low control uh, and, and much more anxiety as a consequence of, of your approximation or your evaluation of that uh, stressor. The other thing we want to look at is not just is it a challenge or is it a threat, is it chronic or is it acute? So is it a one-time only stressor? Is it something that's going to recur uh, or be present over a period of time? Worst case scenario in, times of, in terms of the magnitude of our stress response is something that's chronic, so it's going to be there for quite some time, and it's something that's seen uh, as a threat. Now we care about these, we care about stress and we care about our ways of coping because it is related to our well-being. It's related to our mental well-being but also to our physical well-being as well. Uh, we are mostly going to be talking about uh, stress management as a way to buffer the physiologic effects of stress, but it's important to remember that there are a number of different pathways that stress can contribute to illness. These are the three primary pathways. Uh, it's important to remember that when most of us get stressed, we do the exact opposite opposite of what we need to do to stay healthy. So when most people are stressed, they sleep less, they drink more alcohol, they may smoke more cigarettes, they pull away from their social supports, they eat less food, they don't have time to go out and cook uh, or to prepare healthy meals. So what they're doing as they get more stressed is actually engaging in more health damaging behavior. So that's one pathway just on a behavioral level. Another pathway is that we see changes in medical compliance or medical adherence. We often see folks who have had uh, an exacerbation or a relapse of their disease, their diabetes suddenly gets worse because they've gotten stressed and they stopped taking their medication, they stopped exercising, they stopped doing the things that they need to do to manage their disease and stay healthy. And the last pathway is the physiologic pathway, and, and this is what uh, Dr. Kimeny was talking about and uh, talking about how the uh, uh, stress affects the immune uh, system. All three are important. 
So we want to help to decrease the magnitude of the stress response, this box here. We might also want to help people in choosing more appropriate, more helpful, more constructive ways to cope with the stressor. Uh, this was also in Dr. Folkman's talk, the very first talk of the series. She talked about as we experience a stressor, we think about the stressor, our coping resources. We have our stress response. Remember that can be physical, emotional, behavioral, cognitive. We decide what it is that we're going to do. And our responses to that stressor generally fit into two categories. Problem focused, meaning you roll up your sleeves and you do whatever it takes to change or directly address the stressor. So if the stressor is you have, say, uh, a relicensing exam that's coming up at some point, a problem focused coping uh, mechanism would be to study for that exam. It directly affects the outcome of that stressor. The other category is emotion-focused coping, and uh, it, it's equally important, but really has a different focus. Here, it's not necessarily about doing something constructive to change the stressor. It's doing something to change the way that you feel. If you're in a situation where the stressor is unchangeable, or you've already studied for that, that exam as much as you possibly can, but you're still feeling anxious, distraction might be helpful, calling a friend might be helpful, doing something that you find pleasurable that pulls your mind, that pulls your emotions to a more productive and to a more positive state might be helpful. The best copers are individuals who know when to use what type of coping. Most stressors require a mixture of both types of coping. So you need to know when do I use problem focused, when do I use emotion focused, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. As I mentioned, stress management might include interventions at any point on this pathway. It may include behavioral interventions to prevent you from being exposed to a stressor. Let's say that many of your stressors come from your workplace, they come from your boss, they come from your coworkers, they come from the job task itself. A perhaps very effective strategy in terms of managing your stress would be to quit your job and to move to a different job. You're exchanging one group of stressors for a different group of stressors, but again, you've done something very concrete and behavioral that pulls you away from those things which are causing you stress. That would be here on the level of stressors. Another intervention would be to look at the primary and secondary appraisals you have made and whether or not those appraisals are helpful, whether or not those appraisals are accurate. We'll talk about that more. Another intervention might be to directly affect the stress response that you're having. Uh, and here is really the, the category of medications. So things such as uh, benzodiazepines, uh, pills for anxiety uh, that help individuals to turn down the magnitude of uh, the stress response that they're having. Other interventions may teach you better ways of coping, either in terms of problem solving, rolling up your sleeves and learning how to address a problem more effectively, or in terms of building or eliciting uh, your social supports or, or mood management strategies more effectively. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the basics behind cognitive uh, therapy. Uh, we're really not talking about cognitive therapy per se tonight, but we're talking about cognitive behavioral interventions that have been pulled from sort of a, a full package of therapy. Now this full package of therapy was first developed for the treatment of depression. Uh, and the person who, de who developed them, or, or at least has given uh, a primary credit, is uh, Aaron Beck. He's uh, in the upper left hand or right hand corner uh, of the slide. It was uh, late 1960s. He had been trained in, in probably one of the premier psychoanalytic training institutes. His primary interest was in the treatment of uh, depression, incredibly common, uh, and at that time also very uh, difficult and challenging to treat. Treatment sometimes requiring three to four psychoanalytic sessions uh, per week up to two to three years, uh, and not a, a, whole, a whole lot of evidence to suggest that the, if a person did get better, it was the therapy that was helping them. Well, despite his frustration with the length of treatment that was required, uh, he also began to notice that there were a lot of similar patterns in the depressed patients that he was seeing. They all tended to have a very negative self-image. They had very negative, uh, uh, mostly hypercritical thoughts about themselves. They had a very pessimistic view of the world and of their future. And they also had very negative thoughts about other people and other relationships and what other people might do to them or, or not do for them in terms of supporting them or loving them. He he found that in all of his depressed patients, they had this cognitive triad, this constellation of a way of thinking that seemed, seemed to deepen and worsen their depressive symptoms. The light bulb went on for Beck, and he started to think about, what if I was to directly address the way a person's thinking, 
or if I started at the top, how they're thinking in the present moment, got them to reflect on the way they're thinking, change the way they're thinking, would that change the way they're feeling? Would that eventually change their relationships? Would that eventually change them in a biological sense and that they no longer would meet criteria for this biological disease that we call uh, depression? As you can guess, as the story goes, he found that this was actually quite effective. And now about uh, 40 years or so later, uh, there have probably been over 10,000 or so studies looking at CBT, not just for depression. It's really expanded to anxiety, to stress, to eating disorders, to a lot of different disorders, and have found that there's really a collection of both cognitive and behavioral strategies that can be uh, effective either for psychopathology or just generally for mental health. Some of the general ideas that are um, important to understand before thinking about cognitive interventions uh, is first, we're not particularly rational. That's not a bad thing, uh, but we are not computers. We are not perfect information processors. Our memory is very fluid. The way we think about our relationships, the way we see the world, the kinds of things we remember, the kinds of things we pay attention to are very much subjective. They're very, very much influenced by our personalities. They're very much influenced by our environment. They're even influenced by our current mood states at the time. So it's first of all important that, that you realize it's not a matter of intelligence, it's not how quick you are, that's just the way that people think. That what's, that's what makes us so fantastic and so interesting, but when things don't go so well, that can cause a great deal of unnecessary suffering. That suffering, or what Beck calls uh, dysfunctional thinking, is common to all psychological disturbances. There's sort of a different flavor or a different variety to the types of distortions that tend to occur based on the type of disorder we're thinking about. So for an individual who has an eating disorder, say anorexia, a lot of the distortions are thoughts about the way they look or about their body image or about the importance of control over what they're eating. For depression, it's thoughts about the self, it's thoughts about others, and it's the pessimism about the, the future and about the world. The last idea is to remember the interdependence of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors as represented in this classic triangle that most CBT therapists uh, draw for their patients. This is the idea that the way we feel is intimately related to how we're thinking, which is also intimately related to our behaviors. So an example of that would be, say, an individual uh, is feeling uh, depressed. So that's the mood that they happen to be in. They're feeling depressed, so they're thinking things very negatively. They have, uh, they're remembering everything bad that's happened. They're making negative predictions about the future. They're evaluating themselves very negatively, which makes them more depressed, which makes them think more negatively, which makes them more depressed, and so on and so on. It's not just about thoughts and mood, though. It's also about behaviors here in this bottom right-hand corner. A person's feeling depressed. They're thinking very negative thoughts. What they tend to do is to shut down and withdraw. If things are bad, they aren't going to go well, they aren't going to be enjoyable, you're not going to be very good at it anyway, why would you get out of bed? Why would you bother to try? A person's depressed causes them to think negatively, which causes them to withdraw and shut down, which makes them more depressed, which makes them think more negatively, and so on and so on. The good news about this interdependence is it provides us a couple of different opportunities of where we can intervene to change how a person's feeling. Now again, you can directly intervene with medication, say antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, and change the way a person is feeling. You can also, however, look at the level of thoughts. How's a person thinking? Are there ways that we can reassess or change or reshape the ways they're thinking to change how they're feeling? We can also intervene on a level of behavior. Could we build new social supports? Could we change their job? Could we get them to engage in a different mix of activities that would have a more uh, positive or constructive impact on their mood? And I'll give you some examples of that. But important to remember, we have lots of opportunities, but our two main pathways are entering through the avenue of thoughts, entering through the avenue of behaviors. So we're going to run through several different examples, and um, I thought it would be a lot more interesting, rather than me just sort of talking about these, actually having you do some of these exercises, and we could debrief them uh, a, a little bit. You don't have to do them if you don't want to, but I would just recommend you do have some, place, uh, some space for notes. So we'll do a couple of different exercises as we work through this list. I'll ask for a few volunteers, uh, just so you get a feel of what it's like uh, to do some of these uh, strategies. We're going to look at a few cognitive interventions. We're going to do something called an ABCD. We're going to jump then to explanatory style. I'll, I'll describe activity scheduling. It's probably a little too complex to do it in, in a group that's uh, this large, but then move to talk about somatic quieting. And then I hope we have time to do a social support exercise uh, towards the end. 
So to understand the ABCD, uh, we have to understand sort of the cognitive model that explains why we, we feel and we do the things that we do. Since it's a cognitive model, you can imagine they're going to talk about the predominance or the importance of cognition or of thoughts, uh, of, of the ways we think about situations. The non-cognitive model or the typical model uh, is that uh, there's an activating event, something happens around you, and it makes you feel, do, say, a particular thing. However, the cognitive therapist would say, no, that's actually not quite true. There's a middle step that's quite important that most of us don't think about because it happens so quickly. It's automatic. It's an automatic thought that pops to mind. It's your subjective interpretation of what just happened. So the ABC here is the activating event, something happened. You had some beliefs, thoughts about it, and those thoughts help us to understand why you felt or did what you did as a result of that situation. So here's an example, and this is just from my uh, clinic a couple of weeks ago. I do see patients here at UCSF uh, in the behavioral medicine unit, um, and I try to stay on time. I've been on the other side uh, of the desk before and have waited very, very long time for, for my doctors, and so I try to stay on time, uh, and I try to end on time just so people can plan their days and leave their jobs and all that around, around their appointment times. So first patient comes in on time and uh, said to me, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you always start on time. You always remember what we did before. We always sort of pick up where we left off. It really feels efficient and respectful, and I, I'm really glad that that happened, and I just wanted to tell you that. So that felt good, and that's kind of what I hoped would be the result. We have the next patient that come in. It was actually just the next day after that. We started on time. The patient came in, came in and seemed a little bit unhappy, and I said, well, what's going on? He's like, you know, you're on time to the dot. I don't like this place, it's just like a factory. <laughs> Same activating event, we're starting our appointment on time, very different reaction. And the reason there was a different reaction, there was a very different interpretation of why we're on time. First patient thinks it's a sign of respect. Second patient sh thinks it's a sign of being dehumanized. It's just a factory that they're in. Not that one is necessarily better or worse, but they have different consequences. And when I encourage people to look at the beliefs part, the B part of the ABC, it's not to find the truth, it's not to find what's right or wrong, it's to think about what thoughts are helpful, what thoughts are hurtful. If those thoughts are pushing you towards reactions that are helpful, no need to analyze them. If those thoughts are pushing you to reactions that aren't so helpful, then maybe it's time to take a step back and to think about your thinking. I guess the other point I, I want to make are, are uh, is for us just to remember that thoughts aren't facts. Uh, thoughts are opinions. They're our best guess, our subjective reading of a particular situation. Uh, and if we're able to put our ego aside, we'll see that I think for all of us, our opinions have at times been wrong. Our opinions are changeable. In fact, hopefully they change uh, oftentimes as we're presented with new information. So all beliefs are changeable. They're not facts. Just because you feel it strongly doesn't necessarily uh, make it true. We've also found uh, in the work of cognitive therapy that people not only have these subjective interpretations or these ideas, these opinions, people tend to develop habits in the kinds of ideas that come up. We all take thinking shortcuts, that's the way the human brain works, but we tend to find habits probably based on disposition, maybe based on early family history of the types of shortcuts we tend to make. These are some examples of some habits of mind. Uh, some of them may look familiar for you or they, they may uh, look familiar for some of your family members or for friends. Some people have a habit of over-personalizing, so sometimes when bad things happen they assume that it was done to them. They take it very personally and get angry or hurt as a consequence. There may be a tendency to magnify negative things that happen or to minimize positive things that happen. You may know individuals who have a very hard time acknowledging their successes, who have a very hard time accepting a compliment. They tend to minimize the positive that happens and they tend not to remember it. Uh, selective attention, uh, there's just too much going on in our worlds to pay attention to everything at the same time. We tend to focus sometimes on the glass that's half full and other people focus on the glass that's half empty. Again, not necessarily right or wrong or good or bad, but we just want to look at the consequences of that particular habit. 
I won't go through all of these, but I think other common ones, all or none thinking, so I'm all a success or I'm all a failure, it's all black or it's all white. Mind reading, probably innate, at least that's what social uh, neuroscience is telling us. Mind reading is when we're in a social situation and we're picking up those subtle nonverbal clues from people and we're imagining what they might be thinking. Some of us are really good at that, some of us not so good at it. All of us make errors when we're trying to imagine what another person might be thinking. Some people, because they've been hurt a lot in the past, because they have a sensitivity to rejection, they may always assume that the other person's thinking negative things about them. And of course that has its, its own set of negative consequences. So here's our ABCD exercise, and I just want to walk through an example first, and then I'm going to ask you, if you're willing, to do your own ABCD exercise. ABCD stands for the activating event. That's the A, the B of the beliefs. C are the consequences, and those can be emotional. Those can also be behavioral. And the, the D box in the bottom right-hand corner is the dispute box. This is where you roll up your sleeves and you start wrestling with your thoughts. So you take a step back. You ask yourself, are these thoughts fair? Are they balanced? Am I making making shortcuts? Is there another side to the story? If my friend were to think or to say this, what would I say to him or her? Is there a more constructive way to think about this situation? Okay. So here the example, the activating event is I'm sitting at work and I get an email from the boss moving up an important deadline. Just the facts, just the situation. Beliefs, this is terrible, I'll never be able to finish. This is a setup for failure, I'm doomed. Uh, what a selfish creep. Consequences, I feel anxious, worried, and angry. I complain to coworkers, that's the behavior. The dispute, this is gonna to be tough, but I can go over the calendar with the boss and see what we can figure out. Maybe his hands are tied too, I can share my worries with him. It shows he trusts me with an important and challenging project. So same situation, a very different spin in how you think about that situation, hopefully with different emotional and maybe with different behavioral consequences as well. So what I will ask you to do is to do your own ABCD. And the good thing about this is you don't need a special form. You just need a blank uh, square of paper. You put an X right down the middle, divide it into four boxes, activating event, beliefs, consequences, and dispute. So I'll ask you to do one of those. And I would recommend, if this is your very first one ever, that you pick an activating event that's relatively small. So an example of an activating event that's small would be uh, you pulled into the parking garage and you saw how much it cost to park on Parnassus. <laughs> so you might have certain beliefs about that. There might be certain emotional or behavioral consequences. Then we can work on the disputes. You, of course, can do this with a much bigger event. Uh, but in a group setting, and we'll be talking about it as a group, uh, it's a lot harder to talk about the divorce, bereavement, sort of those big emotionally charged uh, events. Those are very hard to work up some disputes. So why don't you go ahead and just take a minute, write down an activating event, write down some beliefs, write down any emotional or behavioral consequences, and I'm going to ask for a volunteer or two. So I, I will warn you that nearly everyone gets stuck on the dispute box the first few times they do this. It, it's difficult, even for sort of a, a small, uh, low investment activating event, it can still be difficult. When you do it as a group, it's a lot easier to do someone else's dispute box because you're not emotionally attached to it. So how about a volunteer? And I know you guys aren't quite done yet. We can work through this together. We'll just take one volunteer. I'll ask you to share the activating event. We'll, we'll pull out some of the beliefs, talk about consequences. And as a group, I want to see if we can, can fill out the dispute box together. So who would like to share an activating event? Yes, what is your activating event? Uh, stock market gyrations. So stock market gyrations, or up, up and down in the stock market. OK, very good. In an activating event, we don't want to have any sort of interpretation to it. It's just, just the facts. What happened? The stock market goes up and down. What were some thoughts that you had, the belief, the belief box? Uh, uncertainty in how to respond. So I, I don't know how to respond. I'm uncertain about how to respond. Yes. What, what else? Well, there are feelings associated with that, certainly anxiety. OK, so in the consequences box, some of the feelings he had, he felt anxious. What else? Oh, that's as far as I've got. OK, so let's pull out a couple more beliefs. Usually there's a number of, of thoughts if you start digging a little bit. We have gyrations in the stock market. I'm uncertain about what to do. What does it mean that you're uncertain? What are the consequences of being uncertain? Why do we care if you're uncertain? Well, there are, there are fiscal uh, is I might lose money. 
this might be painful if I lose a lot of money. I might get in trouble by my significant other if I lose lots of money. Okay, you're feeling anxious and do you do anything? Do you sell? Do you buy? Do you turn off the computer? What do you do? Primarily, you try to better understand what's going on, first of all. Okay. By, by getting more information. Okay, so what, he feels anxious, and so he tries to get more information. All right. So the way you decide whether or not you need to do a dispute box is whether or not the consequences are something that was undesirable. So he's feeling anxious. He starts digging for more information. Should we challenge the thoughts that he had? I might lose money, this is gonna be terrible, this might be bad, I don't want this to happen. Should we challenge those thoughts? Okay, so there's maybe a different behavior that he could consult an expert. I would say one thing that we can do, it sounds like your behavior, get more information, was something that was very constructive, probably helpful. It might be consulting an expert, it might just be doing more research on, on company stock that you, you've bought. The anxiety is something that, you know, anxiety is a funny thing. A little bit of anxiety can be helpful. You get too much anxiety and it's not so helpful. It's overwhelming and it's distracting and it, it's not productive. So we might want to think about disputes or thoughts that he could use to turn down the anxiety so that he's at his maximum level of functioning. So what might be some thoughts in the dispute box that could help him feel a little less anxious? It's temporary, this is the nature of the market. What goes up comes down and vice versa. Uh, and it may go up any time. Okay, it may go up any time. What else? I have a tax write-off. I have a tax write-off. <laughs> okay, what, what else? He's probably no worse off than he was uh, two years ago. Okay, so this is a long-term process. I can't focus so much on the immediate and what's happening. So, so you guys get it. You sort of get the sense of, of how he could think in different ways to manage the consequences. And in this case, we wanted to turn down the anxiety just a bit, probably keep the same coping behavior because it seems like it was fairly uh, constructive. So that's just a quick look at one cognitive intervention. You can do ABCDs for just about anything. The greater the emotional charge, the more difficulty it is to come up with a dispute. Uh, a lot of times we do this in group therapy settings where people can do each other's dispute box so they get the hang of how to do their own. If you remember when we were talking about stress management, we mentioned that you could intervene really at any point along that pathway in the stress process. The next opportunity we had after the stressors was to look at an individual's appraisals or how they're thinking about a stressor. For primary appraisals, it's how you are thinking about the stressor itself. Is it a big deal? Is it gonna matter? How painful is it gonna be? Uh, uh, is this something that's important to me or to my family? Should I worry about it? common errors that people make in terms of amplifying, unnecessarily amplifying their stress response, are overestimating the likelihood that a bad event will occur. Remember, a stressor can be something that you're anticipating. It doesn't necessarily have to have happened yet. Overestimating the badness or the negative consequences of a stressor, so this is, a, is magnification of possible negatives, worst case scenarios that might happen. Overestimating the duration or permanence of a stressor, uh, and only focusing on worst case scenarios. So uh, again, and this may be a habit or it may just be with this particular event, but teaching someone to step back and to look at that primary appraisal and to look at how accurate that appraisal has been. Now, I know this is a lot of words and I won't go through all of these different questions, but it's questions that you can ask yourself in order to reassess the accuracy or the helpfulness of your primary appraisal. You know, this is not don't worry, be happy stuff. This is just take a step back and say, am I looking at this in a balanced, helpful way? Am I making a realistic appraisal of the situation and what this is going to take and what it will mean to me? The answer may be yes, you are taking a very realistic look. Uh, the answer may be no, you can step back, reassess, and maybe uh, uh, change that appraisal. The other thing that we can do is decide whether or not to think about it at all. Uh, if we look at, uh, this is from the Healthy Mind, Healthy Body Handbook by Sobel and Ornstein. Um, their idea is that essentially in this day and age, probably in, in every day and age, but they talk about in, in modern society, we have too little time and too many stressors, and there's just no way that you can possibly pay attention to every possible thing that might go wrong. It takes too much energy, it takes too much time, uh, and you just would not be able to cope. So they suggest a way of triaging or of separating or 
are sorting out the different stressors that are in your life, and then deciding consciously where to direct your attention, where you would start to roll up your sleeves and what you can really let go. They recommend that you divide your stressors into two categories, important or unimportant. You can already see that the unimportant stuff probably shouldn't get priority. Look at things that are changeable or unchangeable. If we're talking about rolling up your sleeves and trying to change something, you better make sure it's changeable first. What will be most important of those four categories are things that are important, high priority, and things that are changeable. So if you only have a limited amount of time, energy, resources, you want to focus on what's most important to you, what's going to be most changeable. So, uh, 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 examples include arguments with a partner, problems with your boss, or quitting, quitting smoking, all are important, all are very changeable. Now, it is true that uh, we do not have complete control over our lives or our choices or the stressors that we must face. A lot of times, uh, maybe in your job, maybe uh, with the family that you have or the family you married into, uh, there may be other stressors that you just have to deal with. There may be jobs that you're asked to do that you just have to do. Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, I think, some very wise advice from a first mentor of mine uh, who explained that there would be jobs along the way in academia and else, elsewhere that you really don't want to do. And he said, Jason, I want you to always remember that a job not worth doing is not worth doing well. <laughs> if you got to do it, so be it, but don't go for the A plus if it's not that important. <laughs> So we can look at primary appraisals, we can try to recalibrate, we can take a step back and decide if we even want to think about it at all, if it deserves any of our time or, of, or, 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 or our energy. We can also look at secondary appraisals, and remember secondary appraisals are about uh, our estimations of our ability to cope, the resources that we have to face a particular stressor. Here are some of the errors that amplify a stress response is overestimating what it will take to cope with a stressor, so imagining something's going to take a lot more uh, than it actually will uh, to resolve. Underestimating your personal ability to cope, a lot of times people forget that they may have been through a lot, they may have developed a fairly substantial skill skill set, and they may underestimate what they're able to do. They under, may underestimate or forget important coping resources such as time, money, energy, or knowledge. They may underestimate or underutilize uh, friends or family, believe that they don't have the support that they actually have, or they may be just unable or unwilling to tap into those to supports to ask for help that they might need. So the question is, why do we have this tendency to under or over uh, estimate? It could either be primary appraisals or secondary appraisals. Why aren't we sort of spot on accurate in our appraisals? You know, and I think the reason has to, I don't know if I, I, I know the answer. I think it has to do with the fact that we're not perfect information processors, we're not computers, our estimations are influenced by our emotions, they're influenced by our values, they're influenced by our current mood state at the time. Uh, oftentimes they're influenced by anxiety, so if you're feeling very anxious, you're feeling very vulnerable, maybe other negative things have happened to you recently in your past, it's going to affect the kinds of appraisals that you make. The other impact on appraisals, uh, if you look at, uh, there's been studies done where they ask people to estimate the likelihood that they'll be struck by light the likelihood that they will be hit by a car. People tend to be okay in terms of their estimates unless there's been a recent news story or something the media has told them. And you see this transient but fairly replicable blip in the overestimation of how much at risk or how in danger uh, they are from that particular stress or that particular threat. So a lot of influences that can push our estimations around. This is really just uh, uh, recommending that people take a step back and say, okay, what's going into this estimation? Is it my mood? Is it my history? Is it my values? Maybe it's something in my environment that's caused me to over or underestimate. Again, I won't read through all of these questions, but these are intended to help you improve the accuracy of your secondary appraisals. Asking yourself realistically what resources are needed. What are the high and the low estimates? So it's okay to think of the worst case scenario, but you should also be sure that you think of the best case scenario. You know, not, not uh, rose colored glasses, not Pollyanna, but if you're looking at things uh, at their worst possible case, look at the flip side. Just look at the full spectrum, the full continuum, and then make an estimate of how probable those different outcomes uh, might actually be. We're going to talk about how to elicit and how to tap into social supports a little bit later, but I think that, that learning that skill of, of knowing who in your inner circle and what those people in that inner circle can provide can really help us in terms of improving the accuracy of our secondary appraisals. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and, and do another exercise. This is also a cognitive exercise, but a little more specialized. This one is on explanatory style. I'll explain what that is after we do the, the exercise. So uh, explanatory style is, is roughly the explanations that we give ourselves about why stuff happens. Good stuff, bad stuff, neutral stuff. We always seem to need an explanation of why did that happen. So what I have here is a hypothetical event and I want you just to write down uh, what you believe caused this event to occur. You're just filling in the blank, no right or wrong answer. The hypothetical event is your boss selects you as employee of the month and gives you a large raise. This event happened because blank. So just write down what you think caused this event to happen. You got employee of the month, you got a large raise, this happened because blank. And I'll ask for a volunteer and I'll expl explain what those ratings are, are about. So who wants to, to share what you wrote down? Yes, so this event happened because what? <laughs> okay, Be <laughs> because I found dirty pictures of him with someone who wasn't his wife. So you got employee of the month and you got a large race. There's no right or wrong answer. Again, we're interested in consequences of how that, that answer, the, the consequences of coming up with that kind of answer. So we want to look at, in terms of explanatory style, three different dimensions internal, stable, or global. So was the cause due to something within me or something I did or is it due to external factors like luck? So what would you say on a scale of one to seven? One, it's totally external. Seven, it's totally internal. Where would you put that? Uh, a one? Okay, so it's something that the boss did. I might n move it up a few notches because you decided to do something about what the boss did. Uh, but, but you're right, it was sort of triggered by, if he had never done that, this maybe wouldn't have happened. So there's a, definitely a big external piece to it. The stable dimension is, is this a one-time only event or is this something that's going to keep happening again and again in the future? So an un unstable explanation is, is random luck. A stable explanation would be, um, I have a lot of, uh, intelligence, so that intelligence is going to follow me in different areas of my life. So do you say this is stable or unstable? A one-shot deal or is it going to keep on happening? So pretty unstable, kind of a one-shot deal. And global is, is it just going to affect you in your job or your relationship with your boss or is it going to affect you everywhere? Your, your family, your friends, your social life, what do you think? So it's pretty isolated. So here it, it's external, uh, it's, it's unstable, and they call it uh, specific, the opposite of, of global. Now when you have your actual explanatory style measured, there's a number of different hypothetical events and it's averaged over both positive and negative events. And the reason this is important is because we've found that uh, explanatory style is related to an individual's risk for depression. And in general, if a person explains negative events as it's my fault, it's never going to change, and it's going to affect me everywhere, that tends to predispose them towards depression. Depressed people also, when they have a positive event happen, they say, I can't take any credit, nothing positive will ever happen again, and it was really just a one-shot deal. So really, the, the attributions, the explanations you gave us for that event would fit more in the depressogenic category. It's just one event, though, so it's not your style. Uh, so you would, would need to average it over a number of, of other events. So where did this stuff come from? Uh, and I think it's important to understand a little bit of the history because it, it helps us see some of the implications uh, of it. And, and I think it also helps us to see sort of the evolution of, of, of science or research from animal studies up to human uh, levels. So this was the work of Marty Seligman. And, and many of you have heard of uh, learned helplessness or learned optimism before. Uh, he, in the late 60s and the early 70s, also at uh, University of Pennsylvania, different building from Aaron Beck, they were working completely separately, uh, and he was interested in uh, dog studies. Uh, didn't have a term, at, uh, a name at the time, but it eventually became called learned helplessness. And the paradigm was something like this. So we'd have a large rectangular cage, and there was a divider in the center of the cage. On one side, there was a metal floor. On the other side, it was just a, a terry cloth floor. He would place the dog on the metal side of the cage, administer a mild electric shock. It was unpleasant, the dog would jump to the other side. You know, it's very reflect reflexive, doesn't take a lot to explain why that happens. Did several repetitions of that, the dog always jumps to the other side. Next part of the experiment, you put a divider, uh, a 
metal wall, really, in between those two sides of the cage. You administer an electric shock. shock. The dog tries to escape, but cannot. It hits the divider. Can't go anywhere. Keeps trying to escape, cannot. Goes through several repetitions of that until finally the dog learns, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to quit trying. So they just lay down, and they become helpless, essentially. The most important part of the experiment is the last part, where he takes out the divider in that cage. So now the dog can escape. He administers the electric shock, and the dog does nothing. So they actually reach in physically and pull the dog to the other side to show him, hey, you can just move to the other side, put the dog back on the metal side, administer the electric shock, the dog goes nowhere. The dog has learned to become helpless as a consequence of those earlier experiences of being unable to escape. It doesn't take a lot to extrapolate this to people, to see that people who have may, may have grown up in circumstances where escape was impossible, where there was abuse, children are fairly powerless. They may have developed the same sense of learned helplessness, so that even though they're now adults, their lives have changed, their environments are different, they now have resources, now they can escape, they don't take advantage of those resources because they learned to be helpless. There was a glitch in this theory, though, despite its appeal, and that's not everyone who has these aversive events, not everyone who's been abused as a child grows up to develop learned helplessness. In fact, it's less than the majority. There's only a subset of folks that go on to become helpless. So why is that? And the, event, the answer that eventually emerged was it has to do with their explanatory style. Kids who are being abused who said, it's my fault, it's never going to change, it's going to be like this everywhere, they went on to become helpless. Kids who said, this is messed up, this is not me, it's not always going to be like this, there are places where it's different, this is not going to last forever, they did not become helpless. And they were able to survive or even transcend the circumstances that they were given as children. So explanatory style helped us to understand how some people go on to be resilient and why others are unable to do that. I want to talk a little bit about uh, mood shifting in the moment. And we've already really done sort of one exercise of mood shifting. The ABCD exercise can help us to have at least transient changes in our mood. It's not a magic wand. It doesn't take away all of your anxiety. There may still be anxious about the stock market. But hopefully what it does is it, it, it at least decreases the severity or the intensity of those feelings. When some people do their ABCDs, they, they often will rate the initial feeling of anger, sadness, depression on a 1 to 100 scale. They finish the exercise and they re-rate their feelings. And a lot of times they'll see a 20, 30, 50% drop in the intensity of their negative emotions. Uh, certainly better than doing nothing at all. There's a couple of other interventions that we can use to at least temporarily shift an individual's mood. I want to talk a little bit about cognitive reprocessing or a form of journaling. I want to talk about a selective attention exercise. So for journaling, uh, you know, the idea is not new. It's been around for a very long time that maybe keeping a diary is a good thing. Keeping a diary is a, sort of a cathartic experience. It can get a lot of the feelings out and on paper. It's a way to, to relieve stress. It's maybe even a structured way to capture thoughts and to do a little bit of problem solving. Uh, well, finally, someone, uh, and that someone is James Pennebaker at the University of Texas, decided to test out this particular theory and to see if journaling was something that was helpful, both in terms of mood but also in terms uh, of an individual's physical health. So like uh, a lot of uh, uh, academic psychologists, he first started studying students to see if it was a viable idea and then moved to more uh, medical uh, and real world populations. So his paradigm was essentially to bring the students into the lab. Half of them are told to write about a very serious event that happened, to really sort of dig into it, ruminate about it, write about it for about 20 minutes or so. The other group, they're also writing, but they're writing about something very neutral, about the weather, about trees, about something that really doesn't have an emotional charge. He has this, them do this over a number of weeks, gives them mood measures, looked at uh, who went to student health during that time, did anyone develop symptoms, and so on. As you can imagine, in this healthy population, there weren't a lot of health effects for the students, but there was a marked mood effect. And in fact, students who wrote about these charged negative events actually reported a better mood as a consequence of this journaling process. Sort of interesting. They, they weren't wallowing in it, they were reprocessing, rethinking and eventually changing the way they felt about that particular event. Pinnebaker was rightly challenged to say, well, hey, let's take this to patients who have real disease, maybe chronic diseases, and let's see if there's any health effect. 
So Pinnebaker, his graduate students, and others who've picked up this paradigm have looked at a number of uh, different patients, and I'll, I'll give you just a, a couple of examples here. There was a study looking at patients who had uh, chronic and fairly severe, moderate to severe asthma, put them in the same uh, paradigm. They uh, were told to think about the most negative events in their lives, either uh, most recent negative uh, events or in the past or the largest magnitude negative events. The others were told to write about something relatively neutral uh, and, and not emotionally charged. They did this over a period of weeks, and they measured something called FEV1. That's a forced expiratory volume of air. So how much air you can breathe out of your lungs really quickly in one second. The more you can bring out, breathe out, the greater your lung capacity. So it's a sign of improvement uh, for folks who have uh, pulmonary problems. They found that for individuals who were writing about the emotionally charged negative events, they actually have an, had an improvement in FEV1. <laughs> Other studies looked at the severity of symptoms in rheumatoid arthritis. Same sort of results. Patients who wrote about the negatively charged events had better results. Looking at patients who were HIV positive, they found that their CD4 counts, a type of immune cell, actually went up. There was not a, dif a, a difference in terms of their outward appearance, in terms of their physical health, who was getting opportunistic infections or not. But there was a difference if you were to look at their immune cells in a, uh, under a microscope. They had a, uh, a larger number of CD4 counts. It's not a magic bullet, doesn't work for everyone. It neither helped nor hurt bereaved subjects, but I think it's an interesting paradigm that I'm sure we'll get a lot more research on in terms of what's the exact dose, what types of events should you write about, who will this help, and is there a population that might actually be hurt from doing this sort of intervention? We should always remember the potential for harm even in uh, our most promising interventions. Okay, the next exercise I, I wanted to do is, is one borrowed from uh, Rachel Rimmon here. Uh, there's a lot of variants that's out. Uh, Marty Seligman, who now does positive psychology research, has also done research on a, a, a variant of this. Uh, this is something to change your selective attention and in the process to change your mood. So why don't I have you answer three questions, if you can just jot them down in your notes section. So one question is name one thing that surprised you today. The second question, name one thing that moved you today. And I mean emotionally moved you, so don't write down your car. Uh, and the third is describe one thing that inspired you. So one thing that surprised you, one thing that moved you, one thing that inspired you. Now this is an exercise that we've done informally uh, with our medical students and we encouraged our third year medical students to do it. They've uh, just left the classrooms, they're on the wards, <laughs> incredibly smart, uh, motivated, uh, empathic students, but they suddenly find themselves feeling incompetent. And they find themselves terrified that they might hurt someone because they don't know what to do. So they go home at the end of every day remembering every single mistake, remembering everything they did wrong, and feeling absolutely terrible about themselves. So we wanted to give them an exercise to help them shift their attention and to improve their mood. So it takes five, seven minutes at the end of each day. Think about something that surprised you today on the wards in your clerkship. Think about something that moved you. Think about something that inspired you. But how about let's hear from one of you uh, who would like to volunteer these three things that you wrote down. Or how about a volunteer? Yes, so one thing that surprised you today. A client was born in a place you used to live overseas. Yes. One thing that moved you today? Conversation with my husband. Conversation with your husband. And one thing that inspired you today? Um, a phone interview for a potential new job. A phone interview for a potential new job. And how was that inspiring? Because I got to talk about my accomplishments and I realized um, how much I've done. So she got to talk about her accomplishments and realized that she's actually done a lot. So in really just a few minutes, very simple exercises, we've cognitively shifted your attention to things that are positive, things that are inspirational, things that are emotionally moving, and helped you to savor not something that's made up, not something that's false, false, but something that happened in your day that may have slipped away because it wasn't negative. And I think we naturally hold on more tightly to negative things that happen, and we forget the things that are positive. We forget to savor our successes. This is a quick way, five to seven minutes at the end of each day, that we can do that. 
there are a couple of examples I wanted to show you of behavioral mood shifting. So changing your mood at least transiently it doesn't have to do with cognitive exercises. We'll talk about activity scheduling. I'll remind you of some relaxation exercises that might help uh, and wanted to put in a plug for physical exercise. Uh, we know that it's not only good for your body, it's actually good for your mind, both in terms of improving your emotional state, but also in terms of improving cognitive function. You know, we talk a lot today about how puzzles and sort of cognitive challenges can keep your mind sharp. Actually, aerobic exercise has a larger magnitude effect than those cognitive puzzles. You can still do them both. You can do them both at the same time if you want. <laughs> but physical exercise, I think, is, is, is very much an unsung hero. Uh, somatic has to do with your body. So somatic quieting is how to quiet your body, how to turn down the stress response. So an exercise we're not going to do, but I wanted to, to show you, it, it's part of a behavioral exercise for depression, but I think it's also a, an important way for us to step back and to reflect on the choices that we make in terms of how we spend our time and the behaviors uh, in which we engage. A lot of times at the beginning of therapy, we'll ask a patient to do an activity record or an activity schedule. We give them a calendar. This one's a, a little bit shortened just because I ran out of room. There's a box pretty much for every hour throughout the week, and we just ask them to fill it in. At the bottom of it, we ask them to rate their mood on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is the best mood ever, or the best mood uh, on that scale, and 1 is their, their worst mood. We then have them bring it in, and we just look for patterns. We look for days that were high mood days. Were there things you were doing? Were there people that you were around that raised your mood? We look for days that were low mood days. Were there things that you were doing or not doing that really pushed your mood down? We also look for opportunities. There may be sections of unstructured time or where there's just fillers. And I think of TV as sort of a filler, or internet surfing as sort of a, a, a filler. It can be an important uh, distraction at times, but if there's large chunks of it, uh, I think that's an opportunity for a person to make a different behavioral choice that may have a different impact on their mood. So we get them to bring in data, we look for patterns, we try to see relationships between behaviors and moods, and then the next step is we actually want them to schedule a couple of pleasant things to do. And you would be surprised, but for many people, this is a very difficult idea of scheduling something that's fun. It almost seems antithetical to the notion, as, as if fun things are just supposed to happen, or social activities or social contacts are just supposed to happen. I would say we need to give them as much or more attention as we give to our appointments that we schedule. Those certainly take up a lot of time. They're not necessarily going to have a positive mood effect. But it's not just the pleasant activities that we want to schedule. We actually want a well-balanced diet of activities. So we want some things that bring us pleasure, some things that are distractions, some things that help us feel connected to our families or friends. We also need activities that give us a sense of competence, give us a sense of mastery. You know, an activity that recently lifted my mood was cleaning out my garage. It was not a pleasant activity. I'm not one of those cleaner organizer people that likes to do that. But at the end of the activity, I thought, wow, I did it. I did it. It's finished. It's accomplished. It had a mood boosting effect. Now, I don't want all those, my week full of those kinds of activities, but I probably want at least a few of those uh, in my week. Let's talk a little bit about the relaxation response. And, and I know in Dr. Kimeny's lectures and others, they talked about the stress response, sort of all the negative that happens when stress gets turned up. Fortunately for us, uh, uh, we are, are made with uh, all of these internal mechanisms that help us to stay uh, in balance. One of those is the relaxation response or the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, the, the sort of yang to the yin of, of the stress response system. Herb Benson's been writing about this since the 1970s and has been exploring exploring different ways to help us to get into a state of relaxation where it's not just a, a mental or emotional phenomenon, but we actually see changes in our respiration, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, and so on. Fortunately for us, there are a lot of different ways to reach uh, a state of relaxation. Uh, different things uh, tend to be preferred by different people. You can make uh, your own choices about what you like. It tends to in in involve some form of focused concentration. So it could be focusing on your breathing. It could be focusing on a yoga posture. It could be focusing on a mantra. It could be focusing on a prayer. It could be focusing on an image, but it's some sort of focused conversation that decreases the chatter uh, of, of the mind. 
It usually involves a quiet environment, but I've certainly had patients that are able to do this in very noisy environments. It's a matter of what you're used to. Uh, and it requires a, a passive attitude. I have uh, do a lot of stress management with folks, and I, I often have, uh, usually sort of younger men will come in and say, I'm going to be the best relaxer that you've ever seen. I'm going to learn this better and do this faster than anyone else. And so right away, I know that's sort of where we need to start, that it's not about accomplishment or achievement. It, it's, that's the wrong attitude to have. As I mentioned, there are, are lots of different pathways to achieve the relaxation response, and I just have a couple of examples here. There are a lot of fantastic programs at the Bay Area. Uh, in fact, the Osher Institute uh, uh, over at Mount Zion also has a number of programs uh, as well. In your reference list, uh, the last slide and also on the first page of the handout, there's a number of books that you might turn to to get some ideas about what you can do to reach a relaxation response. So the last portion uh, of what I wanted to talk about in the next 10 minutes uh, or so is uh, what I've called depth coping. It can certainly improve your mood transiently, so the mood in the present, but we're really talking about building that foundation uh, of finding a, a source of sustenance uh, that will feed you uh, through the lean times, that will give you the support uh, that you need to carry you through. We'll talk about connection and relationships. We'll talk about meaning and how those help to promote personal growth, perspective, and balance. So for connection, uh, if you look at the research on happiness, you look at the research on uh, subjective well-being, uh, you look at the research in positive psychology, uh, really any way you slice it, the most common and the most consistently replicated predictor of well-being is relationships. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, it can be a relationship with a sibling, it can be a relationship with a best friend, but it's about relationships and I think we really do uh, ourselves and maybe our children a disservice by not investing as much time in teaching about how to have relationships as we do teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, we should definitely add in a, a relationship class or more. Those relationships, though, aren't necessarily just about relationships with other people. Uh, they could be uh, relationships uh, with uh, pets. They could be relationships with plants, even. There's some interesting literature there. They could be relationships to a higher power, however you choose to define that higher power or uh, your spirituality. But first, I wanted to, to keep us down on Earth and to look at, at our, our social supports or our relationships with other people and wanted to do just a quick exercise. We won't debrief this one, but, but I want you just to, to give it a whirl and see if you can just write this right on the slide that's on your page. What you do for this exercise, this is a series of concentric circles. Here's you right in the center of the circle. And I want you to think about your social support network. So, the, so people that you can turn to for help when you need it. And I want you to write them somewhere on this circle. For people who are closest to you, maybe your significant other, your best friend, they might be in your inner circle. Someone who's a friend, but you still have some walls up around them, they'll be in this next level. Someone who's an acquaintance might be a little bit further out. But then outside the circle are all the other people in the world or coworkers or people you just don't really know. So why don't you go ahead and just write down the names of sort of those top people who are in your social support network. You'll write down your name and their position will depend on how close they are to you. So why don't you go ahead and write those down. And I'll tell you how we use this exercise clinically. So in a clinical setting, after a person's been given some time to write the names down in the social support circle, the first thing I look for is whether or not there are any names there. I've certainly had the experience where there are no names that a person can put on the sheet at all. Or you might notice that all of the names are actually on the outside. So no one has even made it into these, these outside rings. For other people, they may have a lot of folks in the outside, but they're very guarded. Uh, they don't have a lot of intimate relationships, so there's no one in the inner circle at all. So first I look for the number or the quantity of social supports. Then I look for the quality. I look for the level of intimacy. Now there's no right number of intimate friends that a person's supposed to have. It looks like it really just takes one close friend to give you the health protective effects that you need from social support. In general, however, it's recommended that you have at least two close social supports. Uh, and I think the idea is if you put all your eggs in one basket and something happens to that, egg, that basket, you're in trouble. So you want at least a couple of, of different supports. The other thing that I look at though is not just who is on the map, 
and how close are they to you, but then have, have the person think about what type of support is that person good at providing. There's a lot of different kinds of support. Some support's very practical. Can you give me money? Can you give me a ride to the doctor? Can you help me do my laundry? Some of it might be uh, informational support. Can you give me advice? Can you help me problem solve and sort of work aloud and brainstorm about this problem? Some folks are really good at that. And other types of support may be emotional support. Who's a really good listener? Whose shoulder do I want to use to cry on when I need to do that? Your job as the person who needs support is to know what type of, of support you need, then to turn to the right person to get that kind of support. There are a few things more frustrating than needing emotional support and going to your problem solver and all they try to do is to come up with solutions and they don't really give you what you need. It's partly their fault for not understanding what you need, it's partly your fault for not either expressing it or maybe going to the wrong person to begin with. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is, is meaning and our search for meaning, the importance of meaning in our lives. And as I was thinking about meaning, uh, the, the classic book that came to mind for me is a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's a book written by Viktor uh, Frankl, uh, actually about uh, 50, almost, almost 50 years uh, or so ago. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit of the story about Viktor, Viktor Frankl for those of you who don't know. Uh, he was a psychiatrist, he was Jewish, he lived in Germany. Uh, uh, pre-World War II. Uh, he and his large extended family, uh, they were uh, arrested, they were put uh, in a Jewish ghetto, and they were eventually put into concentration camps. Uh, he, as a psychiatrist, began to look at the individuals who were in the camp, uh, mostly men in his particular camp, and noticed that some of them died very quickly. Uh, some of them actually survived, despite looking like they absolutely should not have survived. So he began to wonder, what is it that gives a person that will to live? What is it that gives a person that ability to keep going despite the circumstances around them? Uh, what he comes up with is this. Life has a meaning to the, very, to the last breath, the possibility of realizing values by the very attitude with which we face our destined suffering exists to the very last moment. He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. For Viktor Frankl, his why was his family. Uh, and in particular, he would think about his wife. Uh, and he uh, had planned out his second wedding ceremony of where he would propose to her, of who he would invite, what the guest list would be, of what the menu would be. Those of you who have had weddings know how many details go into it and how time consuming it is, but that was his purpose. Reuniting with his wife, with his family, with his parents, with his children, uh, with his siblings. That's what got Viktor Frankl through the camps. When the war ended and he was liberated from the concentration camp, he discovered that uh, he and his sister were the only two that had survived. So here again, he was forced with trying to find a new meaning, a new why, a new reason to go on living. And that reason became he wanted to share his insights with the rest of the world. He wanted to share what he had learned about the importance of meaning and helping us to endure or maybe even transcend suffering. So he wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. He went on to found his own school of therapy called Logotherapy, uh, which I think has been so successful. There's still a Logotherapy school in, in Germany, or actually a couple in Europe, but it's been so successful. Really this idea of the importance of, of, of meaning, of looking for that why, has really been absorbed, has been integrated in almost every therapeutic school of thought. Finding the why or finding that source of meaning uh, helps us to uh, endure not just large sufferings but also small sufferings and certainly the, the daily hassles of life as well. When I think of it more in sort of the, the daily hassles uh, or the stress level, I think of a story that's uh, shared by Steve McPhee. Uh, he is uh, uh, a physician here at UCSF, uh, founder of our palliative care service, a very much uh, beloved, respected, uh, compassionate uh, teacher, mentor, and clinician. His story for uh, the medical students, and I believe their white coat ceremony, they sort of get their white coats, take the Hippocratic Oath, it's very sort of moving and meaningful for them. Um, he tells a story about choices that they need to make. Uh, and the story goes something like this. He starts off, and this is the first day of school, so they're all taking notes and they're, they're all very serious, and says, you know, you have some choices ahead of you, and probably the most important choice that you need to make is what kind of doctor you're going to be. Sounds normal so far. 
And what I mean by kind of doctor is you have to decide if you're going to have a gas tank or if you're going to have solar panels. Some of the pens drop, and they're wondering now what's wrong with this guy. He said, well, what I mean by that is if you're a doctor with a gas tank and you go to see your first patient, and maybe it's challenging, takes some energy, burns off some fuel, you do a good job, you go to the next patient. You burn off some more fuel, it, it's taxing, but you do a good job, you go to the next patient, you burn off some more fuel, and by the end of the day, you've done a good job, but your gas tank's on empty. And that's what you take home to your family. The alternative is to be a doctor who has solar panels. You see your first patient, it's difficult, it's challenging, it requires energy. But in the moment, you realize what a privilege it is to be invited so intimately into the life of another person, to be given the opportunity to make a meaningful and lasting difference. That privilege shines on you, radiates on your solar panels, and it feeds your soul. You go to the next patient, it takes energy. Go to the next patient, it takes energy. And by the end of the day, you're physically tired, but your soul is fully charged. And that's what you take home to your family. So you decide, gas tank, solar panels. Again, in that situation, you still have a stressful job. It's still physically exhausting, but there's been a perspective shift. There's been a reconnection with that source of meaning. There's been an appreciation of the why. There's been an appreciation of the privilege, of the honor, really, that I think each of us can find in our everyday lives. So I hope over the course of, of the talk today, I know it's been sort of a fast whirlwind, uh, that you have some ideas of maybe things that you can try at home. Just pick one of them, try it a couple of times on your own. It might be ABCDs, it may be journals. It might be reading more about uh, explanatory style. Uh, it may be looking at your appraisals and reading through those questions. It could also be activity scheduling, finding a way to reach the relaxation uh, uh, response, or hopefully have caused you to, to think a little bit about the importance of relationships, and especially about the importance uh, of meaning and connection. I thank you. So we do, ha we do have some time for questions. If folks have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes? So, so the question is, if you have two children who've been abused, why is it that one of them says, it's not my fault, it's going to change, there, there's other things out there, whereas the other child says, if it's me, you know, I, I, we don't know exactly what there is a relationship between a pa parent's explanatory style and their child's <laughs> explanatory style. Maybe it's learned, maybe it, it, it's innate. Uh, if you look at qualitative studies of people who have been abused but have been resilient, they found a couple of different things. And probably the most important factor is they found a surrogate of some kind. So there's a teacher, there's a coach, there's a minister, there's a neighbor, there's somebody that maybe sees what's going on and says, hey, you know what? It's not you. We're going to get you out of this. Things are going to change may not know that abuse is occurring, but they provide that alternate theory, that alternate explanation that the, the child hopefully can pick up and learn and use and apply to their own life. Yes. So the question is, with cognitive behavioral therapy, it, what age range is it good for, uh, essentially? Um, you know, the, the youngest I've seen it used is for kids who are five or six years old or so. Um, it, it changes in, in nature because it, you know, it's a complicated to do disputes and to sort of, there's a lot of language that's involved in it. When they do it with kids, uh, they use uh, uh, comic books and cartoon characters and they come up with stories. Uh, and they'll talk about, uh, I'm trying to remember some of, they, they had uh, Polly the Pessimist and Ollie the Optimist. And things, good things and bad things happen to both of these characters and they come up with different explanations. So they, they learn through narratives, they learn through stories, then they make their own comic books and their own stories, and then they talk about the relationship to their own life. So slightly different methodology, but the same general, general principles are used. Yes. So the question is really about the value of optimism or pessimism and, and is there sort of an optimal range. The bias is to say optimism good, pessimism bad. That's actually not true. Uh, we uh, did a, a study, we, um, with Marty Seligman and myself, we did a study of law students 
and we had the idea that pessimism might actually be a uh, constructive trait in law school, to always see the flaw, to always see the crack, to always amplify the negative, to, to do that. Uh, and we actually found that the students who succeeded the most in law school were mildly pessimistic. Now, if they were, were, were highly pessimistic, they did not do well. They were more on the depressed side. But mild pessimism, at least in that profession, was helpful. It would be interesting to do that study looking at physicians. If you think about it, you might want your physician to be a little bit pessimistic, to look, think about all the bad things that might be happening, to take care of them, to test for them, to hopefully prevent them. But that study hasn't been done. So I, I think there is a role for pessimism. There, there's a role for optimism, but probably in, in the mild range in either direction. Yes. So that's a, it's a great question. It's a question about set point. You know, when we hear about weight, people talk about, well, is there a weight set point? Some people are just meant to be heavier. Some people are meant to be thinner. Is there a set point for emotion? Are some people just born happy? And are some people born sad? Uh, and I think you know, for, for anyone who, who've had maybe more than one child or more than one niece and nephew, you know they come into the world with dispositions. Uh, and so I, I think there's definitely a, a genetic or innate component to that. I'd like to think, though, that, that it's not your, a set point. It's a set range. So there's an amount of variability within the range that you're biologically able to achieve. Now, the study that Ellen's referring to is a study by Ronnie Janoff Bullman. Uh, she's a social psychologist, and she looked at two groups uh, of fairly uh, um, unusual patients. Uh, the first group were individuals who had recently won the lottery. They'd become new millionaires. So very happy. It's a big event for most people. They think it will make all their dreams come true. What she found actually is you get this, this, this temporary spike in happiness and excitement and all the things you might imagine. They buy bigger houses and bigger cars and so on. Within a 12-month period, their level of self-reported happiness is back down to where it was before they actually won the lottery. And I think that has to do maybe with a misunderstanding of what makes people happy. It's not more money, it's not a bigger house, it's not a bigger car, it's relationships. And if money helps you have better relationships, which it doesn't really, uh, if, if it did help you have better relationships, you might see more of a difference. The other group she looked at, though, were people who had a very negative event happen to them. These were folks who had been in a uh, motor vehicle accident and who had become uh, paraplegic. So they had become paralyzed from the waist down. As you can imagine, they became very depressed. They became very distressed. It causes huge changes uh, in your life, a huge stress on your family. So you see a big dip in their mood. But in about 12 months, as they had adjusted to their new way of life, they had returned to about the same level of functioning and happiness that they had before the accident actually occurred. Those are fairly specialized groups of patients, but I think it makes a fairly persuasive argument that we're at a particular level, and even if you have big events that happen, there is this pressure to return back to that same level. I'd like to think we can bump that around a bit, but it doesn't take accidents or illness or money to do that. I think it really takes relationships, it takes connection, and it takes, it takes meaning to do that. Yes? Right, so, so she, she's asking about, the exercise was who's there to support you, and it seems like you're on a lot of other people's circles, that they turn to you for support, and at times that feels like a privilege, but at times feels like a, a burden, really. Um, and, and I think you know you have to decide for, for yourself in any social support relationship with those people on your circle, there should be a reciprocity. There should be times when you're the listener and they're the talker, but there should be other times when they listen. And if there's not that sense of reciprocity, it's probably time to re-examine and rethink that relationship if you can. If that doesn't work out, maybe they should move to the further circles, uh, further away from sort of your, your core supports. Yes. So, so an important strategy will be sort of ahead of time, if you can anticipate a stressor is occurring, to do a little bit of preparation, some advanced planning to meet that stressor. You might do some advanced thinking about the appraisals and hopefully rallying your supports to be ready if that stressor should occur. You're right, that can certainly minimize the, the magnitude of a stress response you might have. Right, and very important if the stressor is very strong. You're right. Okay, how about one, one more question, all the way in the back. So, so, so the question is, is uh, about an individual's 
willingness to participate if you can still get positive outcomes or not. And, and I think really the, the foundation of cognitive therapy is that it's a collaborative partnership between the therapist and between the patient. So there does have to be buy-in really to get the kinds of gains that you would hope for. If you're stuck in a situation where you have someone who needs help and they're not willing to get that help, um, you, you can you know, encourage them to see a cognitive therapist, you can buy them the right books, you can maybe share in behavioral interventions with them. We know physical activity is, is a good stressful inter stress intervention. Take them for walks. You can help schedule dual pleasant activities with one another that might help to give them some respite or some relief from a stressful situation. But in terms of actually getting them to sit down and to do the homework, if they're not willing to do it, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot you're going to gain from that. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. Again, I would encourage you to try these out. Thank you.